Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, nice to be here. And, and thanks for inviting me. I'm, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to focus on sort of how future of uh, uh, you know, American world order is seen from North East Asia, specifically, uh, specifically from a, a Japanese perspective. Uh, clearly, <clears throat> the world that, that we're, we're living in is not the, uh, the post-Cold War era. And also the, uh, the, the, the 2000s, right? The, when we were facing uh, sort of uh, terrorist, terrorist threats and, and sort of uh, uh, non-state actors, that era is also over. And also for the uh, past uh, several decades, or maybe even uh, going back to the early uh, 20th century, I think what was happening in the sort of the transatlantic realm was the defining issue of uh, uh, sort of world politics. But uh, these days, I think more and more what's going on in the Pacific sphere and the Indo-Pacific uh, space is becoming more and more important. I think that there isn't much debate about that. And how America is willing to face uh, the issues that's going on uh, in that region as a, a Pacific nation. Uh, more specifically, how America would sort of uh, uh, face the China challenge would shape uh, 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 you know, in a significant way uh, uh, the kind of uh, world order uh, that, 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 there, that we're going to see. And also, in addition to these, you know, geographical spheres, we're seeing, uh, you know, cybers, uh, cyberspace and, and, and sort of the space, outer space, you know, uh, the new domains are sort of uh, uh, that we're facing. Also in that sphere, the uh, competition between uh, and sometimes may, may lead into confrontation uh, uh, between uh, China and U.S. would be the defining factor. And uh, for... Japan and for Japan's uh, uh, sort of national security policy, uh, sort of America, uh, you know, how sort of, or, or sort of the fact that America would remain a resident power in Asia Pacific and retain strong interest in the issues uh, uh, sort of that's happening in uh, Indo Pacific uh, would be quite significant. And Japan's sort of national security policy is premised on this sort of US being a resident power and having interest uh, uh, in the issues that, that's occurring in the Indo-Pacific. So precisely because of that, Japan does not have the luxury of sort of, you know, observing objectively uh, uh, what, where America is and what kind of uh, a world order that we're going to face. Uh, uh, our we see our mission as trying to sort of uh, uh, convince the Americans that you've been a resident power uh, in this uh, region, not geographically, but functionally. And uh, we see it as our role, uh, uh, you know, trying to convince the Americans to, to keep on sort of pursuing that role. Uh, but there have been some major concerns in Japan about sort of, you know, the state of American internationalism. Uh, it didn't just start out with Mr. Trump. I think it started uh, 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 during the Obama era. Uh, uh, although, you know, the, uh, the content of uh, 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 the worries, the kind of worries that we had uh, about the two administrations were totally different. Uh, we sort of catched a signal that the both administration in a very different way uh, was sort of reluctant in accepting this, you know, uh, 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 liberal international order upholding business. But, and I think this is quite well known around the world, but sort of the Japanese reaction to both, you know, uh, administration was that if you compare, you know, Trump's foreign policy and Obama's foreign policy, there was a sense in Japan that maybe Trump's foreign policy uh, might be better, right? And this is not a, 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 a sort of, uh, you know, that was not the popular view in the global community. I do understand that. But if you look at Japan specifically, uh, precisely because Mr. Trump was tougher on China, that not that we supported his, you know, his, his view about the world and how sort of America engaged during, uh, uh, during the Trump era, not that we supported it, but we thought 
it was better than the sort of the, you know, the G2 based notion of US China policy. Uh, uh, then, you know, uh, M Mr. Trump's sort of, you know, a tougher position on China. Uh, from a Japanese perspective, I think, you know, th there was some achievement in Trump's foreign policy in that this notion of peaceful coexistence with China is no longer sustainable. And that we were entering, you know, the era of great power competition. Yes, probably if uh, 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 Hillary, Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, she would definitely have been tougher on China than Obama. But then again, uh, I think there's some doubt whether she, she, she could have sort of defined the era as, you know, a, a, a great power competition, right? Uh, you know, I think she still sort of would have clinged to this notion of peaceful coexistence. So from a Japanese perspective, you know, uh, the fact that Trump uh, team recognized this challenge from uh, uh, China was an achievement, but uh, uh, was, you know, the Trump foreign policy smart in sort of dealing sort of, uh, you know, competition from China, challenge from China? Did th were they able to sort of uh, establish a sustainable sort of competitive uh, policy toward China? I think they were far from that. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you think of US chi China policy as like a huge ship, right? maybe we needed a Trump shock to change the course of that, you know, a huge ship. So Mr. Biden's China policy, uh, you know, he, he is, there's a, you know, a continuation between Mr. Trump's and Mr. Biden's in the toughness. But, you know, of course it's, it's quite different in that Mr. Biden's China policy is not just about sort of confronting China, but more about sort of surrounding China with a desirable order rules and norms with allies, you know, partners and coalition partners. So clearly the scope is very different and it's much more smart and it's sophisticated. But the fact that the policy is smart and sophisticated makes, and precisely because of that, it makes the ex execution of the policy extremely difficult. So I think uh, uh, the, the focal point since uh, Mr. Biden took office in January uh, uh, in his foreign policy was to convince the world that America is back. Right? And I, when he was in Europe, uh, you know, 10 days ago, I don't know how many times he repeated, you know, America uh, is back. And that kind of shows that, you know, he understands the difficulty of convincing the world that America is back. Uh, so the question is, are we, are the world convinced about, you know, Mr. Biden's message? Uh, uh, you know, is America back? You know, we don't know, but so much depends on what's happening domestically, I would say. And it was uh, touched upon by the, the two previous speakers. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, the basis of international sort of action, you know, American internationalism, there is no consensus that we saw during you know, World War II, you know, the great generation, uh, uh, no consensus sort of resembling the early Cold War period before the Vietnam War, and no consensus right after September 11th. We, we, we see none of that. Uh, you know, toughness on China, yes, sort of, but uh, not an agreement and consensus about what kind of role America should accept abroad. Uh, and the partisan divide is so deep and it's penetrating foreign policy, national security policy as well. This, this, uh, uh, this notion, you know, foreign policy stops at water's edge, which was cited by uh, Senator Van der Waard, no longer sort of uh, exists. So uh, there are worries, but for the time being, I guess for Japan, from a Japanese perspective, in order to strengthen the kind of order that we prefer, I think there's no other options to stick with the US. So as, as I said at the outset, 
we see our missions as trying to convince the U.S. that U.S. has to be a resident power and also convince the American people as well that this is not your effort alone, right? Liberal international order during the Cold War days was a unilateral American effort. Yes, there were help from allies, but it was a sort of a unilateral globalism. You know, America, Americans respected the responsibility. But now, you know, that notion is bleak. Right? So I guess we have to tell the Americans, it's not your uh, efforts alone. We would participate. We would do our own uh, uh, sort of, we would uh, 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 take our own responsibility and become forward leading. So I think that's the uh, uh, attitude that you see from Japan. And there's talk about, you know, rising nationalism, in Japan, when Japan tries to accept a, you know, a forward leaning role in security. But I don't think it's about that. It's about upholding liberal international order together with the US, together with Australians and other partners. And, we, and if we actually succeed in doing this, I think we can make the kind of order that we, you know, that, that we cherish more sort of credible, more sustainable, and even stronger, you know, not just an American effort, but you know, America at the center, but many of the other players are playing an important role as well. So I'll end here, thank you very much.